All right. Well, this morning we come to Galatians 5 in verses 1 through 12. And I should mention, you know, it's interesting, um, and I'm not sure if... if um, Dr. Strimple actually meant this or not, if he was just joking, but um, he, he did say that this passage that we're looking at today, verse 6 in particular, which is our memory verse, by the way, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. For some reason, that faith working through love was something that was mysterious, and he gave this, um, this story about how I think it was Dr. Van Til had a class, and uh, they were studying this particular passage and trying to wrestle with the meaning of this, of this text, and um, they were having difficulty understanding it, and I guess uh, a student suddenly raised his hand, and he goes, I, I know what it is, I know what it is, and he said the, the bell rang, and everybody left. <laughs> and so they never found out <laughs> what the student thought. Well, the funny thing is that, that that phrase, faith working through love, is, is something that the Puritans seem to understand better than anyone else, and they explain more than anyone else and applied more than just about anything else. Edwards believed that that is the very essence of Christianity, and I've already told you what it means, but that's, that's what we're looking at this morning. That is really what matters, not circumcision, not the keeping of the traditions, not our obedience, you know, a legalistic obedience to the commandments. It is possessing a faith that is animated by love. That is what really we need to be looking for because th this is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And it's, as Edwards would say, the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever. So it's important that we have this. With this in mind, let me read the text. Uh, this is what we're looking at this morning. Paul writes, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you, were, you who were seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished." I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Well, may the Lord bless <laughs> His Word to our understanding. That last verse is a little bit of a sensitive verse. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that at the end, okay? But let's begin just by getting a running start, again, at what we're looking at. Last time, remember, Paul was continuing to challenge the Galatians, and last week he said this, if you want to be under the law, and that's what the Judaizers are trying to get them to do, is to again submit to the, the law, the ceremonial law, the traditions, the Pentateuch, and so forth, then he said, you should listen to what the law says. Well, what does the law say? Well, the law says in Genesis that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael, who was born of Hagar, the bondwoman, and Isaac, who was born of Sarah, the free woman. Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Remember that Ishmael was the result of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, their attempt to fulfill God's promise in their own strength. But Isaac was born according to the promise. You know, he was the result of faith in the promise God gave to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. Now, from this, Paul drew an analogy, not an allegory, okay, but an, an analogy. 
where he says those who try to earn God's promised kingdom, it, you know, which is through justification, got to be righteous to enter into God's kingdom. Those who try to earn justification, those who try to enter the kingdom of heaven through their works are like Ishmael, slaves to a law that can never save them. But those who trust Christ to receive that kingdom are like Isaac. They become the children of the promise, the children of the kingdom through God's promise by faith. So Paul said, listen to the law. It's giving you this analogy. If you go the way that you know, Abraham and Sarah went with regard to the flesh, well, you're going to end up as a slave like Hagar, like Ishmael, but rather trust in Christ. Well, then Paul told them, he went on to tell them that they needed to listen to the prophet or the prophets as well. Remember, the Old Testament scriptures are divided into the law and the prophets and the writings. Well, sometimes the law and the prophets was a summary for the entire Bible, and the entire Bible does actually bear this out, but Paul pointed specifically to the prophets. God said through Isaiah that even as Sarah was barren, but received strength to bear a child through faith, so the Gentiles who were also childless, now again, we don't have time to go into that whole argument, but the Gentiles who were childless because they had no relationship with God, because they had no husband. It was prophesied by Isaiah that, that they would bear more children to God through the gospel than the Jews who had a husband, who were in covenant with God. Paul is pointing to this Old Testament passage to say that God predicted there would be more saved among the Gentiles than among the Jews. So what he's saying is both the law and the prophets tell us that we should hold fast to Christ, trust in Him, and not in our works. And then finally, he encouraged them not to be, you know, concerned, not to be discouraged by the present persecution, okay? He said, as Ishmael mocked Isaac on the day when he was weaned, the Jews were now abusing them, persecuting them. But remember what happened to Ishmael. Remember what happened to Hagar, okay? They were cast out because they were not God's heirs. So God is going to reject them, the Jews that persecute you, even the Judaizers. He's going to reject anyone who tries to come to Him through their works. So again, hold fast to Christ. Don't worry about the persecution. You may escape a little bit of difficulty now. It's going to be worse in the end if you go the wrong direction. Just bear up under it because as what happened to Ishmael is also going to happen to them, and as what happened to Isaac, an heir of the kingdom, so will happen to you. Now, this morning, Paul's argument, as I've said before, reaches its climax, and here he just gives a summary of everything that's important, and his, the simple truth is this. Being circumcised or not makes no difference, and remember that circumcision, when he's referring to circumcision, he's not talking just about circumcision but he's talking about circumcision as an initiation to everything else the law requires. So circumcision is like a part for the whole. You're going to be circumcised, you've got to do everything, right? Being circumcised or not being circumcised makes no difference at all with regard to justification. That does not matter. All that really matters is that you have faith, a trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but notice not just any kind of trust, but rather a faith that works through love. Okay, he's distinguishing this faith from historic faith, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. Now, Paul begins with the reminder that Christ came to set us free. And remember, what he says to the Galatians applies equally to us. Verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm in your freedom and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He says, remember, first of all, what it is that Christ has set us free from. What is, what is it? Well, we know he set us free from our guilt, right? Adam made us guilty because his decision affected all of us. God looks at us as though we disobeyed him in the same way that Adam did because he was our representative, our covenant head. He set us free from that. He set us free from our corruption. You know, the result of that guilt of Adam 
was that we forfeited that very precious gift that God gave to Adam and Eve, but He didn't give to any of their children until they were converted, and only that by His grace, and that is the Holy Spirit. And that's why when we come into this world, we come into the world dead in sin, and we just desire only what the Bible calls evil. We may not see it as evil, but it is evil if it's contrary to God's Word. He set us free from that. He set us free from judgment. I mean, God is just. Remember, He has to punish all sin, not only Adam's sin that was given to us, but all of our sins. God has set us free from that and from our helplessness because there was nothing we could do to escape this judgment. Now, Jesus set us free from these things through His own life. He took God's yoke upon Himself, the, the law, and He obeyed every part of it perfectly. He took our sins on the cross and He died in our place. He rose from the dead, showing that His payment was accepted. We saw that recently when we were studying the resurrection. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could trust Him with this loving kind of trust. And trusting Him, Jesus gave to us everything that He did, everything that we need. He gave us that perfect righteousness. And so, He has set us free from the law with regard to righteousness. Okay, that's the freedom that Christ has given to us. And having freed us, Paul says, first of all, we must not give up that freedom. And we would be if we again take the yoke of the law upon ourselves to justify ourselves. If we do that, we remain slaves, slaves to our guilt, to our corruption, to our condemnation, and to our helplessness. Now, he goes secondly to say this, if we take that yoke, Christ will do us no good. Verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, let's not forget, Paul has been laboring this point over and over again. Now, perhaps we've heard it, you know, so many times, it's like, well, okay, I already know this, let's, let's move on. But Paul, we need to, again, we need to make sure we fully understand this, and every single day we, we rely on Christ alone. Now, he has been laboring the point that justification can really, theoretically, only come in one of two ways, God's grace through Christ or by the works of the law, theoretically. Now, either Christ does the work or we do the work. Okay, now, if Christ does the work, that's grace. But if we do the work, that's legalism, that's, that's works. And these two are diametrically opposed. They're, they're at opposite ends of the continuum. It has to be one or the other. It cannot be both, and it cannot be a combination of both. It has to be just one or the other. What Paul writes in Romans 11:6 is true. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. I hope we get the point. Grace is a free gift that can't be earned. Works is where you work for something that you are trying to earn. Those two principles are opposite. So if it's by works, it can't be by grace. Okay? So if we receive circumcision, if we submit again to the law for righteousness, then we are turning away from Christ. And so we will not, we cannot benefit from His work. Now, Paul goes on. He says, if we decide to step in that direction, if we decide to take that on ourselves, well, then we'd better be prepared to do everything that the law requires. Verse 3, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Remember I told you that circumcision, I think it's the term is what, synecdoche, where you use a part for the whole. Circumcision is just a shortcut way of saying keeping the Mosaic tradition. It's kind of like Calvinism is a shortcut to talking about all oh, this, this doctrine that, you know, the, the Reformers believed. Okay, there are shortcut terms, and this is one of them. If you submit to circumcision, if you receive circumcision, you are committing yourself to doing everything that the law requires. Now, theoretically, 
if we could keep the law, if we could do everything it requires, if we could do it perfectly from the time we come into this world at conception until the time we leave, okay, not only in our actions, but also in our desires, in our thoughts, in our words, then we could be justified by the law because then we would, in fact, be just. That's the same way that Adam could have earned righteousness for us in the garden is if he had obeyed the law of God perfectly. Now, the problem is, if you fall short in any way, then you, you lose everything, okay? To break the law at one point, James tells us in James 2.10, is to become, was really to break all of it. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Now, you know as well as I do, the Bible teaches that we could never be justified by the law because we already came into the world guilty and corrupt, as we've already seen. There's only one person who could have, and that is Jesus. Conceived in absolute holiness by the Holy Spirit, being in person, God, the second person of the Godhead, in our nature, He kept the law of God perfectly because that was His heart. He had a perfect heart that loved righteousness perfectly. So he kept the law perfectly from the beginning of his life to the very end of his earthly life because that what was it, is what was in his heart to do. Now, if we trust him, that is the righteousness that he will give us, okay? The only righteousness by which we can be justified, the righteousness of Christ. Now, Paul again goes on. Since grace and works are at opposite ends of the spectrum, to embrace works is to be, uh, to be justified, is to reject Christ and His grace. Now, we need to understand Paul's argument here because otherwise we may draw a wrong conclusion from this verse. He says in verse 4, You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now, we do need to be careful because it does sound like what Paul is saying here is that a true believer can fall away from Christ, okay? Now, we know that he can't be saying that because if he is, he'd be flatly contradicting not only himself but also Christ. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Paul writes in Philippians 1 verse 6 to the Philippians, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of, of Christ Jesus, okay? If he begins the work, he will complete it. How do we know that's what he means? Romans 8, verses 29 through 30, and again, put on your thinking caps. This goes through, it's kind of like the order of salvation, sort of like the different things that happen to us uh, through the process, as it were, of salvation to from God's foreknowing us all the way to our glorification. And the one thing I want you to notice as I read this, because this is really the main point, nobody slips through the cracks from one category to the next. Okay, that's the thing you need to see here. So let me read it. Paul says, for those whom he foreknew, and remember foreknowing doesn't mean knowing what we would do. It means foreloving us. Those whom he foreloved... He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, all whom he, he foreloved, He predestined, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. Notice that He who began the good work will perfect it in the day of Jesus Christ so that everybody foreknown reaches eventual glorification. Again, no slippage. And then Jesus says something very similar regarding His sheep, those who trust Him, in John 10, verse 28. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
See, that's, that's one of the comforting points of Christianity, isn't it? Of what the Bible teaches us. If we have savingly, lovingly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing in heaven and earth that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And we can fall a certain distance away from the Lord. We, we do fall into sin, but He won't let us fall completely away. We will not be cast away. He will only let us go so far and no further, and then He will bring us back to Himself one way or the other. Okay, we will not entirely fall away. So then, what is it that Paul is saying here if he's not saying that you can lose your salvation? Well, what he's saying is this, that if we reject the grace of God that God offers in Christ as a free gift, and we turn back to this merit-based system of works for our justification, then even though it appears as though we had something to do with Christ, we really never had anything to do with Him. If any of the Galatians, if any of us were to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ for works, you know, we were to, to turn to some kind of a legalistic system, and we were to continue in that and, and never repent of it and continue to trust in our works, it would show that we never really trusted in Christ in the first place. John writes in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Now, we're beginning to zero in on the difference between saving faith and a faith that doesn't save. And it's this, if we're just merely convinced of the facts of Christianity, what's called historic faith, remember how the Reformers said there are three parts to faith, you know, there's the content of the faith, there's the assent, I believe these things are true, and then there's the trust, the fiducia, right? Well, there's a lot of people in the church that have just the first two. They, they know the content, and they believe it's true. And they're even taught that if you believe these facts are true, that you're saved. But, but that isn't true because, as James points out, the devils believe these things are true, and they tremble. But they are not saved. If all we have is a conviction, we're convinced that the facts are true, we can just as easily become convinced they're not true. We can lose that conviction, and we can fall into, well, we can fall into anything. But if we are born again of the Spirit, we'll never fall away, as we've just seen. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. God will complete the work that He began. Now, if we have this faith the Spirit creates, we can know, Paul goes on to say, that the kingdom belongs to us, okay? that we are justified and we are heirs of the kingdom. And that's really what he means in verse 5. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now, I've already told you that faith, this kind of faith, is something that is worked by the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.8 that we are saved by a faith that is not of ourselves. Okay? It is the gift of God. Jesus tells us the Spirit is the one who gives us faith in the new birth. Remember how Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born of the Holy Spirit before he can enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, we can only enter the kingdom of heaven through faith. This regeneration, this new birth by the Holy Spirit is what gives us the faith that we need to trust in the Lord. And that becomes even more apparent when we understand what this faith is, how it operates. You know, what is it that gives rise to faith? It's nothing other than the Spirit of God working His holy nature in us, giving us a love for what is holy so that we, our hearts automatically go out to Christ when He is offered to us in the gospel. Now, he, the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> is the hope, he says, of righteousness. You know, Paul said, um, we are waiting for the hope of righteousness. It's not that we're hoping for righteousness to come. This is where, you, you know, you have a subjective or objective genitive, you know, is this, are we hoping for righteousness or is this a righteousness, or I should say a hope that comes from righteousness? It is. Okay? It's a hope that comes from righteousness because by trusting in Christ, we receive a righteousness that gives us hope. But what is that hope? The hope is the kingdom 
of heaven. Okay, the kingdom is the hope of righteousness. And this hope that his righteousness gives us is the hope that we will receive the kingdom, that we will enter into the kingdom. I mean, we're already citizens of the kingdom. We've already entered into the kingdom by faith. It's not the hope that these things might be true, but it's the certainty that these things are real and they will be ours. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 24 through 25, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it, okay? The hope is that we're going to enter into it. It's not, again, the hope that that, you know, hope against hope that those things are true. They are true, and we know we're going to enter. We have that hope. With perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. That hope comes from the righteousness that comes from Christ that is received by faith, faith that the Spirit of God gives us. Okay, so faith gives us this hope, this hope of entering the kingdom of heaven. But this is not just any kind of faith, but a faith that works through love. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Now, we've already seen that faith in the facts is not going to save us. The kind of faith that does save us is a faith that works by love. So here's really the point. When the Spirit of God makes us alive, okay, in the new birth, what He actually does is He unites Himself with our souls. And in doing so, He unites us with Christ so that the life of Christ flows in us. Now the Spirit of God is united to our souls. What difference does that make in our lives? Well, as soon as He's united to our souls, He begins to work His character within our souls, and his character is, not surprisingly, holiness, okay? But what is holiness? Well, holiness is a love for what is good and what is right and what is just and what is perfect. That's what he works in us. So just as the Spirit of God conceived Jesus in the womb of the Virgin and sanctified that human nature, made him perfectly holy, so when he causes the new birth in us. He creates holiness, this, this love for holiness in our souls, this desire for holiness. Now, as Edwards would point out, holiness is the reason why we hated God before, because His holiness threatened us, right? His justice and His righteousness condemned us. But holiness, now that we have the Spirit of God, is why we love Him. Okay, and that's what makes the, the great divide between the two camps of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. In the kingdom of light, you've got a group of people who love God because of the Spirit of God. In the kingdom of darkness, you have people who don't because they don't have the Spirit and they are threatened by holiness. But once the Spirit of God works this grace in our hearts, and this is the point, we love and we trust Jesus because we cannot do otherwise. That's just what our hearts incline towards, Him, because He's holy. And we begin to incline towards His law, and we begin to obey it because we love the holiness of the law, that it's good, it's right, it's perfect. It's also why we love worship, why we love the Word, why we want to spend time with Him, because the Spirit of God has worked this holiness in our hearts. And again, it's not a perfect love. It would be wonderful if it was. I mean, as far as that love is concerned, it may be perfect, but we're still very imperfect. We have a lot of corruption in us, and that's why we still struggle. But if we have it at all, you see, even if we have just a very little, that's all that really matters. Okay, not whether we're circumcised or uncircumcised, but whether we have a faith that is animated, made alive, that is moved by this holy love. This is the mark of a true believer. If we have this, Paul says, we belong to Him. And if we belong to Him, then we can look forward to this hope of righteousness, which is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to us. We are 
citizens of that kingdom. Unless we're born again, we can't see the kingdom. Unless we're born of the Spirit, we cannot enter the kingdom. But if we are born of the Spirit, we have entered that kingdom. The kingdom belongs to us. Okay, well, that, that's great news if you're trusting in Christ, right? That the kingdom belongs to you. But again, it's got to be more than just believing the facts. We actually have to be trusting Christ because we love who He is. Worshiping God because we love who He is. Loving holiness across the board wherever we see it. Knowing that we're still going to struggle with it. Okay, well, how does Paul conclude this section? Well, now he turns to the negative side of things and begins to indict those who had taught them otherwise. Okay? He had pointed them in the right direction, and that's the way they were going until they were led astray by a false teacher. Verse 7, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Whoever this individual was, Jesus, or excuse me, Paul says, he wasn't sent by Christ. Verse 8, this persuasion did not come from him who calls you. But sadly, this teaching had affected most, if not all of them, already. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Paul's reminding them whenever error is introduced into a group of people, let's say a church, you know, believers, it can very easily spread throughout the congregation and lead us away from Christ unless it is checked, unless the antidote is given, which is why we always need to be on our guard. So Paul has seen it. Paul's giving the antidote to it. And Paul was confident that his antidote, his letter, would put them back on the right path. Verse 10, I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view. Remember I told you that Paul is viewing the Galatians as true believers, even though they're being tempted to go follow the Judaizers. What he's saying is, you have the Spirit of God. I'm convinced the Spirit of God is going to bear witness to the truth that I've given to you, and he will bring you back to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he had confidence. Like I said, God will only let his people stray so far and no further. The Spirit of God brings you back through conviction. But he was also confident at the same time that things were not going to go quite so well for the false teachers. <laughs> okay. He says in verse 10, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. You know, the Bible tells us that God does not have much patience for those who lead his people astray. And I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples in Mark 9, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble. Now, I know it sounds like this is one of those texts where Jesus has the children, you know, and, and one of these little ones, and the children aren't around in this text, okay? But he's, what he's saying is that whoever causes even the least who believe in me to stumble, what will happen to them? It would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea, okay? The Lord has no tolerance for false teachers, for those who lead His people astray from the truth. Now, it's interesting that um, these false teachers were apparently trying to say that Paul agreed with them. That is what I think is behind verse 11. He says, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. It, it's as if Paul is, is arguing against the Judaizers who seem to be implying that he's preaching circumcision, and so you shouldn't have any issues, right? I mean, the, the guy who planted the church, Paul, we, we all revere him as an apostle, he's preaching circumcision. Why would they say that? Well, maybe they had heard that Paul had Timothy circumcised, remember? Uh, as a matter of fact, Timothy, I believe, was from, I think he may have very well been from that area. I'll have to double-check that, but I think he was. This, Paul picked him up on the second missionary journey, and he said, this man will be useful to us. Let's bring him along. But before they, they did bring him, because his mother was a Jew, his father was a Greek, 
he had him circumcised, uh, which he said we have the freedom to do. We have the freedom to be circumcised or not as long as you don't depend on it for your justification. But he had Timothy circumcised so that it wouldn't offend any of the Jews wherever they went evangelizing. Well, maybe they turned that into a way of enlisting Paul in their own ranks, saying, look, look, Paul's teaching circumcision. But Paul's response to, this, to that is this, if that's true, then why are the Jews persecuting me? If that's true, then hasn't the, the, the cross, the, the stumbling block of the cross been abolished? But yet Paul continued to insist on the cross. Remember what he said in verse 21 of chapter 2, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. To insist on the cross is to insist that you cannot save yourself by your works, that works are not enough. That's why Christ had to die. And that would be offensive to any works-based religion. And that's the reason why the Jews took exception to Paul. If I'm preaching circumcision, then that stumbling block of the cross would have been abolished. But I'm preaching the cross. I'm not preaching circumcision. And that's why I'm still being persecuted. <clears throat> so I'm not teaching. I'm not siding with the Judaizers. I am preaching against the Judaizers. And then finally, Paul expresses his desire, his desire for the false teachers. Verse 12, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Now, this can be a little bit sensitive, okay? Um, what does he mean here? Well, there are, there are questions, you know. Is, is Paul here pulling? I was wondering if the Larsons are going to be here because uh, I know they really like Luther, okay? Was he, was he do, doing a, Luther, a Lutherism, you know? Um, where, you know, there's nothing you can say too foul for the enemy, you know, type of thing. Would, would Paul say something like that, or did he mean something else? Well, some say that what Paul was saying is if the Judaizers want to insist on circumcision, <laughs> they should just go all the way and emasculate themselves, okay? That sounds rather crass, but why would Paul say something like that? Or did he, first of all? Well, First of all, under the Old Covenant, if somebody did this or had it done to them, it would cut them off from the worship of God. Okay, now here's a sensitive passage, Deuteronomy 23.1, but I can read it because it's God's Word. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay, that cuts you off from God in the Old Covenant. You're going to listen to the law, the law, well, they should emasculate themselves and be cut off, okay. Now, the language could certainly bear that interpretation, and it means something like that. We don't know exactly what it is that is being cut off. You see, here's, here's the point. Others believe that really he doesn't mean literally, you know, the emasculation, but that they would be cut off from the church, the true worship of God, as though they had been emasculated. So again, think about what Jesus said about false teachers and how God deals with them. And look at how Paul is looking at these false teachers and what he thinks should be done, okay? That's how serious Paul viewed this error. Now, let's not forget, not every error is this serious. Okay, this is falling away from Christ. This is being cut off from grace. This is an either or. This is destroying the gospel. That is an error that must be spoken against, and it's a very serious error. But that doesn't mean that everything that we disagree on is such an error, and we have to separate from one another because we disagree on, on you know, minor points of doctrine. This is primary, okay? Those who believe in works, righteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul is going on to say, neither will those who teach it Actually, he's saying it's going to be worse for them. James writes in James 3, verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. To whom much is given, much is required. You need to make sure if God 
you know, calls you as a teacher, you teach the absolute truth. You do not lead God's people astray. It's a very, very serious thing. So, what is the point? The point is we need to make sure that we're trusting with Christ, you know, trusting Christ, trusting Him alone, not our works, and that we are trusting Him because we love Him, because we desire Him, because He is beautiful to us, not physically His appearance, but His character, His morality, His holiness. That is what makes Him attractive. By the way, um, think of the alternative. <laughs> What if he were just like us? He would be hard to love then because you never know what he was going to do. You know, uh, Jonathan Edwards pointed out that holiness is really what makes God beautiful because picture God without holiness, a God with infinite power and knowledge and presence, the ability to do whatever he wants to, but he's not holy, he's evil. He would be the greatest conceivable monster. But holiness, he says, adorns the, you know, the whole being of God. It makes all of his attributes lovely. We should love him for that holiness. That's what makes him safe, you know, to those who trust in his son, but what makes him very unsafe to those who won't because God is a God who will judge sin. So let's make sure we're trusting in Jesus, trusting him alone, trusting him with a loving faith. And because of what Paul says about these Judaizers and what's going to happen to them, and what his desire is for them, let's make sure that we're promoting truth wherever we go, you know, that we're sharing truth, that we don't say anything that we're not convinced is the absolute truth. Let's try to promote the truth in others. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, uh, again, help us to appropriate all of these things and, and also to prepare to come to the table.